Um, so I am Steve, and for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of my backstory um, and uh, a little bit of reference for where you are in the room right now. Um, obviously, we have a camera on this console so that you can kind of reference what I'm doing on the faders uh, and knobs as I'm showing you some stuff here. Um, this is uh, an X32, which is pretty popular uh, church console. So most of you guys have probably seen this if you don't have one at your church and you're operating on it um, in a weekly capacity. Um, so I grew up uh, in the church. Um, my dad is a pastor, still is a pastor. Um, I was on staff as a worship leader for 10 years after I I uh, came back from college, uh, but I started when I was 12. We had uh, somebody running audio. We were uh, a portable church for 25 years uh, and setting up in schools and cafeterias and uh, breaking out the truck at you know, 7 a.m. every Sunday morning and roll in all the cases and start laying cables. And, um, and I just kind of, I loved it. I loved concerts. I loved worship. I loved kind of the whole thing. And uh, had a guy who was running sound to my dad's church, ended up stepping away, uh, and there was a hole, and my dad was like, well, do you wanna learn how to do this thing? And I was like, oh, we'll give it a shot and see what happens. And uh, 20 something years later, here I'm sitting here. So um, yeah, we started uh, when I was 12, just you know, asking a million questions of other guys who were running sound in churches and doing this, and uh, started reading manuals and checking out you know, all the tutorials and help references that I could get my hands on and um, just kind of started putting the pieces together uh, one step at a time. And so just kind of learning kind of half book knowledge, half real world experience and other guys who have been through it. Um, and because of that, I got the opportunity to go um, do uh, audio with a ministry team in college and we traveled all over the Southeast on the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, and then I came back and in 2005, uh, alongside of being on staff at my dad's church, we ended up, um, that was a part-time position, so they were only able to bring me on for 20 hours or whatever. And uh, so in 2005, I started a company called Audio Integrity uh, to supplement that income, and I was doing uh, all the local events that anybody would hire me for, and um, started to uh, build some steam through that, and I've been able to do some pretty large events uh, in the Northeast region over the past uh, 15 years. And so now I'm on staff as a project manager and the live production coordinator for Somerset Media Group. And so we do district conferences and um, local concerts and events, and we do a bunch of installs. We've probably been to most of your churches. Um, and uh, so we know a lot of attics and basements and walls and get to explore all that fun stuff too. So um, kind of have both sides of that, the install and the live stuff in my life. Um, but yeah, really kind of the overarching um, kind of passion for me is uh, really just production in worship and uh, creating a, an experience um, that connects people to the heart of Jesus because that's really what we're here to do. And uh, so there's a, you know, a lot of ways that you can dive into that and a lot, of, a lot of paths that you can take on how you explain all that. But really, I just love, I love worship. I love seeing people's hearts being connected to Jesus. I love how production helps do that. Um, and uh, some of my favorite memories and moments are you know, a room full of people um, with just their, their arms and hands raised. Um, and production is doing what it's supposed to do. And the worship leader and the band are doing what they're supposed to do. And it uh, just kind of opens up this moment for God to come in and do what only he can do. So um, that's why I'm passionate about this stuff and why I love getting to do this. So, um, so you know a little bit about me now. Uh, we'll dive into some of the tech stuff here. And uh, I'll just kind of go through my, my typical setup routine, and then um, I have some tracks over here that I'm going to go through, and we'll set some of those up. And uh, I'll just take you through um, kind of a, a sound check, a virtual sound check, and uh, we'll kind of um, do some Q&A after that. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with this, I'm just going to kind of give a general overview, um, but some of you uh, may not know what some of these things do, so I'll just walk you through it, and uh, hopefully it's beneficial for you. Um, on this console, if you sort of take this 
section of the board here, uh, you have these different banks of faders, and that would be your input section. So that's all the stuff coming in, either from a stage box or from uh, microphones plugged directly into the back of the board, or you can take it from a laptop over a USB card. There's a bunch of ways to get it into the board. Uh, but essentially, these um, are all taking your inputs. Uh, so the way that this console has it laid out is you have 16 faders here, and they fly. So what happens is they have a memory. They remember where you push it, uh, and then it holds it there for when you come back to it. And so you can fly to the next bank, and now you've got another 16 faders here. Uh, and all of these are customizable. You can label them, color code them, um, give them whatever sort of uh, identifier that you want so you know what you're working with. Um, you have 32 inputs, and then you have a bank of auxes and effects. Um, and so your auxes are typically your iMac, your iPod, uh, whatever your kind of walk-in, walk-out music would be. Uh, and then over here is your effects returns. Um, so you have sends and returns in effects, um, and we can dive in deeper into that in a little bit if we... Uh, if we want to have some questions about that. But basically what happens is you have an internal uh, effects processor going on in the console, and so you send it, uh, you send the reverb unit some signal, and then it comes back out, and the output of that is going to show up on these faders here, and this is how much would go back into your house mix. Um, so that's uh, kind of the input side of things. Over here would be your output side of things. Uh, you got some banks here. You got DCAs. DCAs are cool um, in terms of grouping uh, faders. DCA stands for digitally controlled amplifier. Um, it operates similarly to a subgroup. If you are familiar with subgroups, basically you can take, uh, you know, say you have a drum kit with 11 channels in it, uh, and you want to have one fader so that you can ride your drum kit up and down without having to, you know, it constantly. Uh, manage all those faders and try and keep the mix and proportion and all of that. What you can do is you can assign all of those um, to a DCA, and the way you would do that is you just hold down select, and then you select uh, all the channels that you want to go into that DCA, and now it's in there. Um, if you pull this fader down, basically it's, uh, uh, if you kind of view it as a remote control uh, volume for those faders. If you pull this down, it's going to tell all those faders to be down, even though all these are pushed up. You're not going to get any volume coming out of this because the remote control, you know, the digital controlled amplifier is telling it not to give it any volume. If you push it up, it's going to give it a ratio. So if you push it up to unity, it's going to pass everything at the level that it's coming out in the fader. If you pull it down to 20 dB under, uh, it's going to be, you know, roughly half the volume of uh, what your faders are set to. So um, this is kind of a, a sticky troubleshooting point that I work through a lot of churches with um, when they're asking about, you know, why aren't I getting sound coming through? I see the signal on my uh, board, you know, but I'm not having anything come out of my mains. Um, DCAs can be super helpful, but they can also be something to keep an eye on, make sure that they're turned up and they're not muted. Um, and all of that. So um, that's what a DCA does. So that first bank is all DCAs. You have eight of those that you could assign eight different groups of things to. Uh, your next bank is buses. And buses are um, monitor sends, effects sends, sends out to your live stream, uh, in-ear sends. You can really make them whatever you want them to be. There are two versions of buses that you can use. One is pre-fader, and one is post-fader. Um, how you set that up is going to depend on your application. Pre-fader is going to be uh, what you'll have almost all the time for inner monitors, floor monitors, um, things that you want to kind of create a separate mix and you want them to stay until you change them physically. So if I go route a bunch of stuff to bus one, then uh, all that mix is going to stay exactly how it is until I go back into bus one and I change that. Uh, if I have that routed to post fader, um, post fader will allow that entire mix to follow the main fader uh, volume level. So the reason that's helpful is if you have, if you're using that as a overflow feed to a hallway or a nursery or, um, you know, a live stream or something like that, or if you are sending it to effects, 
and you want that level to go up and down with your changes on the main mix. So you only want to move your you know, lead vocalist on one fader. You don't want to have, have to go move that four times to change your lead vocal. Um, if you have your buses set up in post fader, you can uh, push up the main fader, and uh, then your post fader buses will all follow the level of that. So you pull that down, and now all of your other volumes in your post fader buses turn down with that. Um, so that's super handy. You just want to make sure that you're using the appropriate uh, pre-fader, post-fader setting in the right application. Because if your in-ear monitor mixes are set to post-fader and you start messing around with your faders, now all of a sudden your band is going, why are all my levels changing? I didn't do anything. So, um, and that's if you're feeding that off of the board. So uh, that is kind of the two versions of buses that you can use there. So natively, uh, when you pull out an X32 out of the box, typically your first 12 buses are set up as pre-fader, and then your last four are set up as post-fader, and your last four are typically routed to effects one, two, three, four. Um, so if I, let's do this in real time. See, let's have some fun here. So I'm gonna go effects, and as you can see up here, I don't know how much you can read that, but it's one, two, three, four, over here, this is bus 13, bus 14, bus 15, bus 16. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select it up here. And it is uh, just set to a hall reverb right now. Um, if I go sends on fader, sends on fader is on this console a way to uh, have your faders represent what's going to that bus. So if everything's pulled down here, um, nothing is going to be routing to bus 13, which I have selected here, while this red light is blinking. Um, which looks yellow on the screen, but it's red. Um, the uh, faders here, even though, so when I go back and I turn off sends on fader, all the faders are still up and things are muted. Um, but when I come back here, this is representing what's going on uh, into, uh, from the bus here into the bus that I have selected. So I'm going to take my fader here that my mic is on, and I'm going to push this up. And my typical approach to this, there are two approaches to how you route effects. Um, my typical approach is you're going to push uh, all your faders on the send end up to Unity, typically. And then I'm going to take my return faders, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and I'm going to push those up to as much level as I want. Um, there is another way you can do that where you can leave your output levels up at Unity, and then you take your sends and you push them up to the levels that you want. Um, there's no real right way to do it. Uh, it's just a preference and a workflow decision. Um, but there's a million and a half you know, YouTube videos and opinions on how to route effects and how to make that work. Um, so for now, I'm just going to leave my, uh, my mic here. I'm going to route that into the bus at Unity. I'm going to come out of sends on fader. So now I'm back to my main mix. And you can see my main level is right here. And I'm going to come down to this. And you see love, some level on effects one on the output here, which is muted. And as I push that up, you're going to start to hear effects come into the mix. And so this is how you route your effects. So if I come over here and I mute the send, then even though I push this up, it's stopping it before it gets into the effects processor uh, from the bus here. So the bus is going into the effects processor, and then it's going to come back out to here. So if it's muted before it gets into the, the effects processor, obviously you're not going to get any of that effect. Um, and if I open that back up, you hear the effects come back uh, on that. So that is really all you need to do to set up your effects. Um, is route them to the bus that you want to send them to, assign the effect that you want in the effects unit, which is up here, uh, and I'll walk you through that in one minute, how you change those. Um, and then uh, it's going to route back to your output here, and you turn those up. And then uh, your effects come out here, and you just turn that up to the desired level. Um, you can do that you know, four times. You just copy that same process, and you can have up to four effects. Um, you can throw... Uh, I think the X32 limits you to four effects. Um, and they, do, they return on stereo. So each one of these uh, faders is ganged together. Um, 
So all you have to do is push up one fader, and both faders are going to follow. And you'll get your left on the left fader and your right on the right fader. Um, and that will do that. Um, so let me now dive back. We'll rewind a little bit. Now you've kind of got your fader bank overview. This is your input section. You've got your different banks here that march through that. Your output section, you've got your different banks here. Um, the only thing I didn't touch on yet is your matrix. And your matrix allows you to send um, a copy of your main left-right feed with its own level and its own EQ out to a hallway, a building feed, um, and a recorder, you know, wherever you want to send that. Um, so you really only get to send left-right to that, but it does give you separate compression, separate EQ, separate volume, uh, so you can kind of dial that in. Um, but it will just copy your main mix. Um, so you only have to mix once, and then it'll just send it to a bunch of places um, and copy that. Um, let's do channel strip overview real quick. Uh, so I've got my mic here. I'm going to hit select, and that's going to bring up this fader. Um, here you have your gain. Uh, gain is uh, the first place I always start on every channel. And typically on a... Uh, dynamic mic, like a regular vocal mic, an SM58 or some sort of regular microphone that does not need phantom power, uh, you're going to shoot for uh, kind of between negative 18 and negative 12 on the meter here, and that's about where it changes from uh, green to red uh, or orange. Um, and that's a, a pretty standard place to have that. Um, condenser mics get a little trickier because condenser mics uh, don't show up on the meter. Um, quite the same way, but you get more volume before your meter gets to where you think that should be. So you're going to feed back. You know, if I go to crank this up and I try and get it up to negative 18, you're going to hear it start to feed back before I get to that point. So um, condenser mics, like headset mics and drum overheads and uh, stuff like that, uh, you're going to uh, want to just sort of gauge that more by how much gain you can get before feedback than actually pegging, you know, I need to be at this spot, you know, at the, at the meter um, and trying to land that mark um, because you won't. You'll feedback before you get to that. So uh, just another little troubleshooting tip that I've run into uh, through uh, my years of mixing. Um, so you've got this. You've got a low frequency. Um, and I'll bring this view up here a little bigger so you can see. Uh, so your low frequency um, shelf or your, your low cut um, filter is going to allow you to uh, take out low frequencies uh, at a, a preset uh, frequency. So I can roll that all the way up to here and you'll hear that all that low end just kind of disappeared um, because it's saying nothing below, whatever this is set to, I think it's 400. Nothing below 400 hertz is going to come out of the microphone on that channel. And if I take this all the way down and I go down to you know 35 hertz and I add some of this into the sub, now you'll hear some of that low end coming through um, the low end of the sub there. Um, so for a typical starting point, uh, I tend to start around 80 for vocal mics um, with some headset mics and um, you know, more sensitive condenser mics, I might boost that up to uh, 100, 110. But you just have to realize that the higher you push that up, the less low end body you're going to get out of your mic. So, you know, that's going to reflect in how thin your, um, your, your mic ends up sounding. So usually between 80 to 100 is a good spot to make that happen. Uh, and then you have your EQ. Um, and I'm going to do this in real time and try to not make this feedback too much. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm going to keep my compressor kicked in, so hopefully we save all of our ears. Uh, I'm just going to flatten this EQ. Reset all. Boom. All right, so here's a mic. You just got it out of the box, and you put it on your pastor, and it sounds like this. And you're like, that doesn't sound anything like all the other conferences I hear. Um, so. What you want to do, uh, typically there is something in your low mid that I, uh, I'll go find and I'll start with. Um, this is my EQ approach almost a thousand percent of the time. I just do this over and over and over again and I get great results with it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my low mid frequency 
And if you have an RTA, um, which is the real-time analyzer, you see all the little lines bouncing around on the EQ, it helps you out a little bit because it shows you where those hotter frequencies are. So your red frequencies uh, are your hotter frequencies here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna boost it up and go, whoo, there it is, I found it. And now I'm gonna go the other direction with it. And I'm gonna pull that back and I'm gonna widen this uh, filter out a little bit. And so now we've started to warm up and uh, that's getting a little better, but still a little bit of mid-range junk that's kind of in there. You kind of hear it ringing on top, uh, sort of in the 800, 1K ballpark. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my uh, high mid filter and I'm going to roll that down and I'm going to go find that and I'm going to go, oh yeah, there's that right there. Great, cool. And just pull that back and I'm going to widen that out a little bit. And now there's a little bit kind of down in here, and it's a little bit of ooh, ooh, and there it is, right there, and I'm gonna pull that back, and magically I can push this up and I sound like me. So that's how you uh, go find all those trouble frequencies and you pull them out, and there is a little bit of, um, you know, you can, take some creative license with how artistic you want to get after you kind of get rid of that junk. But I usually always start by uh, going and finding those trouble frequencies. I get rid of that. And now you're basically back to, um, if I were to take this mic off and talk, you know, hopefully I sound pretty close to what I sound like on the mic. The other advantage to that is uh, you can then take your pulpit microphone or your headset microphone or your wireless handheld or whatever, you can pass that between 12 people and everybody's gonna sound like themselves. There is no magic like I have to EQ it for this particular person because really all you're doing when you do that is you're just dialing in frequencies that happen to not feed back on that one person but as soon as somebody else has different frequency tones in their voice, they're gonna come up and it's gonna start to to feedback and ring. So um, I'm a big proponent of uh, EQing the mic uh, for you know, taking out the, the problem frequencies like we, we just went through. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, then everybody sounds like themselves. So um, what's cool about that is I will typically do that. I'll do that for instruments as well. Uh, try and get a kick drum to sound like a kick drum. Uh, and I'll walk you through that in a minute here uh, on some of these tracks that I have. Um, and as you build a band, um, you uh, then start to hear the drum kit come together, the bass come together, the guitars, the keys, and then all of a sudden the band plays and you're like, holy cow, that sounds like a band. That's amazing. Um, and really all you've done is you've eliminated the, the hurdle of the instrument going through the PA system and sounding like itself coming through the PA. So um, you just have to kind of take um, that approach of I need to really try and replicate this thing to sound as natural as it does acoustically, try and make it sound louder and bigger. Obviously, kick drum isn't going to pound you know, through your chest like it does through subwoofers um, when it's not mic'd up. Um, but in terms of overall tone and uh, that kind of stuff, you really want to try and make that uh, reflect itself as naturally as possible. Um, so once we go through gain and EQ, um, then what we do is uh, we uh, come to compression. Now what compression does, for those of you who don't know, is it basically uh, draws a line, and it kind of is represented in this graph here. Um, and I will kind of flatten this out so we can see it from the beginning. Um, so it's just going to march up this little hill, if you can see that going on there. Uh, and as much as I talk, all that signal level is going to re be reflected. It's just going to naturally uh, work itself up and down that little hill. Um, what, it, what a compressor is doing is it's saying, I'm going to let you get so loud, and we call this dynamic range. This is you know, the range from very soft to very loud. Um, and uh, what it's going to do is it's going to let you get so loud until you hit that limit that you set. So we're going to bring our threshold down, and we're going to say, uh, okay, I'm going to let it get to about here. Um, and the reason I chose this is because this is about my average speaking volume. So uh, you can see it just start to peak the red right at the top of that meter there, uh, and then it'll just light up occasionally as I'm talking in a normal tone. 
But what will happen now is we're going to say for every um, 3 dB that we go over that threshold, um, we're going to reduce it uh, a decibel. Um, and so it's going to gradually uh, start to reduce the volume. So it still sounds like I'm getting louder when I get big, um, but it's going to knock that down. So if I shout, you kind of see the compressor start to kick in a little more. Hey, one, two, hey, one, two. And so you see that meter kick in. And if I pull this compressor out and I go, hey, one, two, hey, one, two, it has a little less control. Um, and when you're on the verge of feedback or you have a, a lot of instruments on stage and stuff, a compressor is a great way to kind of help tame uh, that volume level um, to keep things under control. Um, the other thing it does is it allows your, um, your, your vocalists and your, uh, your vocal mics for you know, pastors and announcements and that sort of thing. Uh, it allows you to kind of have a, a level um, sort of window for your volume to live within so that if somebody's really kind of diving in and getting intimate and uh, speaking to your heart and then, you know, they want to come back out and really kind of, you know, punch you in the gut with a big fire and brimstone message, um, you're not sitting here constantly pulling up and down the fader as you're following that. Your compressor kind of does that work for you um, so that you can, uh, you know, kind of um, let that manage itself in the background a little bit. Um, if you squash a compressor too much and you squash this down, all of a sudden your volume is going to start to go away because it's saying we hit this limit and it's not going to let you get any louder. So no matter how loud I push the fader, everything's just going to sound squashed and weak. And um, that's actually going to affect your tone as well. Let me open this back up. It's going to affect your tone uh, in your mix because it's going to start to make your um, compressed things uh, more mid-rangey. So if you're overcompressed and everything starts to sound like muddy and mid-rangey, uh, I would check your compressor and make sure that your, um, you know, your meter isn't like lighting up the whole bar all the time. Um, so yeah, the compression is a super useful tool, and uh, I grew up uh, in the days of analog and. Um, you know, I remember patching, I had like one compressor that I could work with and I had to pick which channel I wanted it on. And, uh, so now you have a compressor on every channel. It's like, uh, I feel old, but it's, a <laughs> um, yeah, I remember grabbing, you know, 300 pound racks and wrapping cable and having to patch the consoles in all the time. Now it's like, oh, look, it's all right here. This is set up in 10 minutes. It's great. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so that's kind of how I'll set up a typical vocal channel, and I think I sound pretty much like me. It's a little hard to tell when you're EQing yourself, but um, that's uh, what we got going on there. So I'm going to come over. Um, I was trying to break out these stems individually on the console, but uh, I was fighting with um, GarageBand a little bit to get that to do that. So I just have, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come out on left, right, here, and I'm going to just make the same settings happen across the board, which I think they are, and I'm going to link these. Um, so another handy feature of this console is that you can link uh, channels together, and if you want to do that, you can only link an odd and an even. You can't link two and three. You have to link one and two, or three and four, or five and six. So when you're plugging things in, you kind of have to think through that a little bit. But um, if you want to link up stuff, you just grab one or two, uh, and hit the select button, and uh, you're going to come to the home page, and the first uh, item it gives you here is link, and you just press link, and it's going to say, do you want to link it? Go to channel one and two, say yes, and now when I push up one fader, both faders are going to follow with me. Um, so I'm going to push those up. I've got some stems here. I'm just going to march through and build them. Uh, a little bit, and I'm really just using the same principles that we just walked through. I'm using gain, I'm using EQ, I'm using compression, and we'll build this out a little bit and see what we get. Um, here it looks like we start with some pads. So we've got that.
Um, so if I take this here, and you can't see this over here, but uh, actually I'll do it over here so you can see. Um, my EQ in. Let's take this back out. Where's that? Bit? Okay. Um, so if I go and I bump this up, now I can make stuff super. through this real quick. Well, what we have is, uh, in this configuration, in this PA, is we have aux-fed subs, which means we have separate levels going to uh, the subs um, from what's going out to the main uh, speakers up top. Um, and the way that we have it set up in this configuration is it's running through the mono bus, which they give you a dedicated knob up here. Uh, this is your pan left-right for your mains. Uh, your mono bus will send um, the levels that you select out to uh, the channels that you select uh, out. If you turn them up on here, it'll send it out to the subs. Uh, and the main fader for that is down in your matrix section on the uh, sub fader right here. Um, so if I take this pad and I bump this up, you'll start to feel a little more of that in the low end. And you see a dedicated meter for that uh, right next to your main left right meter is over here. So we've got that, kind of bump that, make that feel big. So we've got that. Now if I take, let's take a bass. Um, and I'm just going to take a couple tracks at a time here, and then I'll start to compile tracks, and we'll have some fun with that. So that's driving through the sub there. So you've got a little bit of your high end. Um, you got a lot of low, kind of rumbly stuff happening. So if I go find that, I go, there's that. That's the one we don't like. And we'll take that out a little bit. I'll give that a tighter filter because this is a bass. And uh, I'll give this some more gain so we can listen to this. Um, then as we give it some more sub, you've got some body without having that low mid, kind of washy, warm, you know, rumble thing happening. Um, so that's typically what I'll do for a bass. Let's go see if we can find a kick here. Yeah, it's still a bass. Let's mute the bass. Uh, kick is here. And you hear on here a little bit more of the uh, kind of snare bleeding through the kick mic. Um, and that's not terribly uncommon because of proximity of where it is. Um, but we'll take that and we'll go, uh, in this application I'll probably give this a little more sub so it has a little more punch. And then I'll go find that theater's a little muddy and slappy there. So we'll warm that up. And I'll take this back up a little bit. Go find this. And pull that out. So now you have a nice warm kick that has some punch but doesn't have a lot of washy uh, you know, uh, muddiness kind of swirling around. Um, so, um, as you can see, what I'm doing is I'm just taking levels and then I'm taking EQ and 
Uh, I'm just sort of forming each of those channels to try and represent themselves uh, well. I'll do a couple more, and then we'll build a mix here a little bit. Uh, let's take this acoustic. So acoustics are fun um, because every acoustic guitar sounds different. So there is no like one EQ that you can take and be like, make my guitar sound amazing. Um, you basically just have to take it and uh, just sort of listen to what it's given you and work within that um, and try and take out the frequencies that are uh, resonating in the guitar itself. So we got this. taken uh, some EQ uh, and just, uh, you see I'm not making major movements, but I'm just I'm trying to keep as much of the natural body of the guitar as possible, but also taking out, um, you know, the, uh, the problem stuff that makes it sound metallic or mid-rangey, honky, you know, all those adjectives that we want to try and get rid of. Um, and then I've just given a little bit of a compressor to kind of level out. You know, as those strums hit, um, they're a little louder than the rest of the play. So uh, the compressor kind of helps smooth that out a little bit, keep that nice and even. So we'll take that, and um, I'm probably going to have to repeat a little bit of this over here as I start to build my mix. So let me do that. I'm going to build this mix one at a time. I'm going to reset these. I'm going to take the compressor off. And let's start to build some stuff. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see it on my laptop here, but I'm, you can hear what's going on as I bring things in.
can also solo some things here, so I'm going to pull some things out as I'm listening to individual tracks. things I want to clean up, but for the most part, I got a good starting point, and then I'll come back in, I'll add some vocals, and we'll sort of sit that in the mix there. <laughs>
So you can see through one song there, um, basically what I was doing is I was kind of building from the bottom up, taking kick, snare, kind of compiling the kit with the pad that was laying the foundation there, and then I was taking um, you know, the electrics and acoustics, and uh, there's still some more work I could do within that, but um, you know, trying to create a general baseline um, mix to set a foundation for the vocals, and then I'm laying the vocals, usually, you know, five or ten percent on top of that, uh, so that the vocals are intelligible and, um, you know, the congregation's able to distinguish what's going on, but it's not like the vocals are way out here and the band's way back here somewhere. So, usually trying to, to mesh those and gel them. Um, but I, uh, you kind of saw my brain working through that whole song as I'm just kind of taking it track by track, and I'm compiling the uh, drums with the bass and with the pads, and then I'm laying, uh, you know, keys and guitars in with that, and then you know, I'm trying to uh, make one solid band sound come together, um, and then you know, you're doing the same thing with your vocals and making your vocal, your lead vocal sort of mesh with that, and then sliding your backing vocals in there, and then you kind of lay your effects on top of that. So that's my typical approach um, when I'm setting up a sound check, and then. You know, usually I'm doing a line check in a real world scenario with a band uh, and, you know, going line by line like we just did. And then what I'll do is I'll have them play a song. We'll do monitor adjustments and stuff. And then it'll usually take me another song or two. And then it's really kind of dialed in. And then from there, you've got your mix set up and ready to go. And as the engineer, what I'm looking for is um, cues that I need to be aware of uh, for the service or the show. Um, like uh, guitar solos, or you know, if somebody else is leading this song, or um, you know, we're gonna break down to a piano moment over here, and those things are good to know, um, so that you can kind of help support the band in that. Because um, there's nothing worse than like a guitarist taking a solo and they're not in the mix at all, and everybody's like, "What are we looking at? I have no idea." So, um, you know, it just helps uh, with that communication. And that's a whole different. Uh, conference on communication between teams and all of that. But um, the more that uh, we can be servant-hearted towards each other in that, the better the experience is for everybody. So um, yeah, that's really uh, kind of what I wanted to walk you guys through. Um, we can take some questions now. We want to throw it on that mic. Does that make sense? And we'll uh, see how it goes. Let me unmute this. Uh, hold up. There we go. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you so much, Steve. That was awesome. Awesome. Let's give it up for Steve. Um, so here's what we'll do. Here's what I'd like to do. We can. I, I think we can take a few questions now. Um, we'll probably go to break a little bit earlier than the schedule said, because uh, Steve doesn't know this, but I'm going to throw a curveball at him <laughs> and ask him to do one more thing after the break cool. on audio, right before we go into video. Um, but man, the EQ compression stuff was worth its weight in gold. Um, I love that stuff. Anybody else get anything out of that EQ compression? Just awesome. Chasing that feedback out of there. And it's amazing what you can do with EQ. It's like crazy. I was curious how you would uh, mix a tambourine or a shofar. I didn't hear that. In the, <laughs> so if you um, could do a video later about yes, tambourines and shofars, for sure. that would be Lots awesome. Lots of compression. Um, okay, so <laughs> questions? <laughs> yes. I, um, I, I, I have two, two questions. One is short. Uh, it's just, uh, what do you set the look up for a, for a bass? Um, that's a great question. Um, what I'll typically do for a bass uh, is I'll usually do about somewhere between 20 to 35 hertz. Because um, the whole intent of the bass is to provide that low end um, of the mix. And so you, you don't want to chop that out. Um, sometimes I won't even give it a low cut at all. I'll just let it go all the way open. Um, you you kind of want to be careful with that sometimes because if you uh, end up you know, if the system's not set up well and you end up driving the bass through, you can do some damage to the subwoofers if, you know, it's trying to take, like, 
10 hertz through the subs and they're not meant to do that. Um, but yeah, I, I probably wouldn't go much higher than like 20. If, if there's some like funky, you know, low end rumbly thing happening, I'll slide it up to 35. Um, but the other thing I'll do is I'll take, let me go back to this channel here. Um, I'll take a frequency and um, you can adjust the width of this. So for a vocal, I'll typically do a, a curve that's nice and smooth like that to take out a, a whole chunk of low mid. Um, but for a bass, obviously we do that, we're gonna lose a lot of that tone. Um, so what I'll do is I'll make that nice and tight and I'll go find that treble frequency and I'll tighten that frequency up and then I'll pull that out until that treble frequency goes away um, and I'll approach it that way. Did you have one more or is that? <laughs> For sure. Um, I'll give you the 30 second version. Um, you do the exact same thing for all your channels. Uh, gain, EQ, compression. Um, and a lot of times it's already done for you because it's, if you're doing it off of the board, it's going to follow that. If you're doing it off of personal mixers like P16s or something, um, then they kind of have to do a little bit of that work on their end. But um, the, they're, even in that situation, they're still following gain and usually following some sort of EQ. So um, as far as setting them up, uh, as an engineer, I don't care. Um, as a musician, I'm also a worship leader and a musician. Um, I want you to do whatever you need to do in your in-ears to make you the best player possible. So as a drummer, you probably need to hear your kick drum, you probably need to hear the click, you probably need to hear the lead piano or lead guitar, and you need to hear the lead vocal. Everything else is kind of irrelevant. Bass player probably needs to hear kick drum, uh, needs to hear some of the same things. Guitar player obviously needs to hear themselves, needs to hear their blend with the other electrics and the keys and stuff. So every mix is gonna look a little bit different. Um, so there's no one way to be like, set up your mix this way. What you don't wanna do is just jam everything way the heck up and now you can't distinguish anything because that's just unhelpful and it doesn't make you a very good player. Um, I, I'm a minimalist when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I'm like, just throw up in the, your mix the stuff you need and keep down the things you don't. And if you find that you're missing something, then you can add that as you go along. But um, you know, if you really need to hear that electric solo, you can turn that up a little bit, but you probably don't need to hear the electric player all the time if you're you know, the drummer you know, or whatever. So um, that's typically my approach is keep, keep the important things in there, try and keep the other stuff out of it, uh, and almost always turn up your click because that will help you. So Two other questions that I see. I think, did you have a question? Yeah. And then I see one in the back, and did I just see another one? And then a third one here. Mm -hmm. Here. Here we got you. Yeah. How are you finding trouble frequencies? Are they based on the sound that you're looking for, or is it based on hot frequencies? Um, yeah. So it's almost never looking. It's it's almost never what I'm looking for at the beginning of it. Um, every room is going to present you its own set of challenges with its acoustics, and that's what I'm looking to play off of. Um, so there are um, there are room modes, and there are. Uh, you know, going to be frequencies that bloom up depending on parallel surfaces and what your seals, ceilings and walls are made out of and what your floors are made out of and um, how bright or how damp the room's going to respond. Um, so I'm almost always looking to come out of the gate trying to level that playing field um, and just take the speakers and make them uh, sound uh, like I, I take the same approach when I'm tuning a room. Um, I'll take the speakers and I'll, I'll try and find all those things that are, uh, you know, like you've got this here. And you go, whoa, this is pretty awesome and gnarly right here. And that's just going to be a whole pile of, um, you know, the majority of that junk. And I'm just going to take that and I'm going to scoop that out. That really has nothing to do with the tonality of what I'm looking to make the mic sound like. That has everything to do with how the mic is responding to the speakers and how the speakers are responding to the room. And what we're dealing with here is um, gain before feedback. So the, the actual challenge is that the speakers are feeding back into the mic, which is feeding back into the speakers, which is feeding back into the mic, and it's creating this, that's why they call it feedback, because it's just creating this constant loop. Um, and so we're looking to negate that effect as much as possible. Um, so when I'm talking about finding those frequencies, that I'm, I'm looking more at what the room is doing, what the speakers are doing, um, and as well as their mechanical uh, 
tone that is just being introduced because it's an electronic device um, that is introducing its own sonic characteristics. So I'm trying to scoop some of that out too. Um, most of the time I'm doing it with my ear. That's, okay. um, that was yeah. Uh, I'll use the RTA as a guide uh, if there's like a trouble thing that I'm like, hey, hear player, this, but I don't. Are you trying to flatten it on like, with, with a uh, guitar or something? I, I understand the feedback from the vocal. Um, with a guitar, what I'm looking to do is make it sound as natural as possible. Okay. Uh, that's pretty common for most instruments. Um, I'm looking to make that uh, sound like when you pick it up and you pull it out of the case and you strum it acoustically. I want it to, I don't want it to sound boomy or boxy. I want to try and make it sound as, as warm and natural as possible. So. We got a question right back here. Oh, I get a microphone. No. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lord. Okay. Um, two questions. Yep. Uh, question number one um, Can you walk me through, walk us through, like when you have a live band EQing each of those uh, vocalists, instrumentalists? Um, click tracks, whatever you're hearing. Um, do you have uh, a standard operational like practice or anything like that when you're EQing each of those instruments? Do you, you know, everybody shut up, stop talking, stop playing, and you do it one by one, or do you say, "Hey, band, run through sure. a song yeah. and and let me attack this"? Yeah. So question one. Um, no, that's a great question. Um, typically, what I'll do is I will um, I'll do a line check, uh, and that'll be one at a time. So I start with. Uh, uh, almost always it's, you know, if it's a full band, it's kick drum, snare, hat, rack tom, floor tom, overhead, overhead, bass, keys, electric, acoustic. That's my, that's my input list. Like that's just, I know where everything is. My muscle memory, I know where to find all those faders. That's, I just, that's where I lay everything out. Um, and I'll just march through um, those channels one at a time. Um, and it's pretty, uh, pretty common practice to take it that way. Uh, if your band doesn't do that, I would get, encourage them to get into the habit of doing that um, because that's going to allow you to isolate everything. And you, you can't just take a full band and be like, all right, give me 32 inputs and I'm going to figure it out as we go. Um, you you kind of have to really isolate each of those channels and build them together. Um, and a, a good sound check will take you 10, 15 minutes probably to march through that. A sloppy one will take you an hour. So, you know, as the band gets more used to that. Um, it, the biggest challenges I find, uh, and the, it, it really just comes back to respect and, and sensitivity, you know, of the band understanding that you have a job to do and you just need some time um, to work on that. And then, you know, you understanding what the band needs and giving them what they need for their monitors and their mix and all of that. So when everybody kind of understands that concept, um, you can walk through sound checks pretty smoothly. Uh, the most obnoxious sound checks I've ever done are when the guitar player is just sitting there playing a solo as I'm trying to like <laughs> line check a bass or you know the keyboardist is yes. you know learning his part. You know you really just want to do that on your own time. That's not mm. this is sound check. This isn't rehearsal. Do your rehearsal your rehearsal. This, right. You know we have a few minutes here to get this dialed in. It's going to take a half hour to get it done. If you're doing that it's going to take 10 minutes to get it done if you mm -hmm. are just cooperative and you let me do that. So, um, but again, I mean, that's got to come with a heart of communication and respect with your worship leader and kind of partnering with them to do that. Um, but yeah, I would encourage teams to kind of operate that way. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, that's. That's a great approach is to, if you can be building monitors while you're doing those line checks one line at a time, then your mix is being built and your uh, monitors are coming together at the same time. And then you can, you know, during that song or two after your line checks, it, everybody should be pretty close at that point. You're just making minor adjustments. Right. So. Two minutes and two more questions. One here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. So along the line of monitors, because that was my second question, mm -hmm. um, other than getting rid of them, which is the right answer, we are still uh, using wedges on stage. So okay. we have quite a bit of, uh, sorry, <laughs> still quite a bit of, um, you know, 
music on stage for our musicians and our vocalists to be able to hear what they're doing. Sure. How do we find a good balance between what they need to hear uh, that's not interrupted by the the you know the the house speakers, right? Um, but also getting a good balance in the room. Is it still the same approach uh, yeah. when you're EQ in your room as to we're having in ear monitors, or is it a little different? Um, yeah. So in ear monitors make that a lot easier because you're really only dealing with one set of speakers at that point. When you have multiple sets of speakers and wedges, um, you have to approach that a little differently. Again, it comes more, it's less technical and it's more relational. Um, you kind of have to have that relationship with your worship leader and your band and say, hey, it's all wedges and mud and I can't do anything with this. You know, we need to figure out a way to balance this out a little bit. Um, my typical approach to floor wedges especially is like pick the one or two things you absolutely need. You don't need an entire mix in your wedge. You know, you, if the bass player's got his bass over there, you're going to hear it. If the drummer's playing, you're going to hear it. And so you need your vocal, you need your guitar. You don't need a kick and electric and bass. And I mean, it's just going to amplify everything. Everything gets louder. Everybody else gets louder because they can't hear. And uh, before you know it, you're just kind of washed out. Funny little story. When I first started doing this, and I was, I don't know, 15, um, I had like nine speakers that we could use for wedges at our church and I would set them all up and I had side fills. So we had wedges and side fills and we had two little Mackies out on sticks for mains and it was like 90 dB on stage before I turned on the PA. So it's a, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, real quick, show of hands. How many people are in churches that have in-ear monitors? Most. All right, then how many are doing wedges? Okay. All right, cool. Great. Sweet. Uh, we got time for one question back here, but you can sneak in too. I have a question. Um, when you're in like advanced, do you typically are recording through a DAW system automatically already, or do you pre is everything pre recorded and then you take it to the DAW system? Or um, so clarify what you're asking a little bit because there's a lot of ways that DAWs can interact in a live environment. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to ask are you talking is about like, multi-tracking? Yeah, event? yeah. That's what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. Okay, um, it, it depends on the event. Um, if we're talking at church, uh, then typically what I'll do, uh, like what's cool about the X32 is um, you have a card that you can take out and you can multi-track okay. those 32 stems right out to GarageBand or Logic or oh, okay. Pro Tools, uh, and it will just copy the channels that you have coming into your board, send them out as 32 channels going out to your DAW. Um, okay. And then you can go back and you can modify all that okay. later in post production. Oh, um, all right, that's yeah, that's what yes. I want. Yeah, the post production stuff. Okay. Um, does that answer that, or are you yeah, looking yeah. for some more specific? Oh well, just quickly. Yeah. Do you ever use the DAW system right away with the event, or does that ever? Um, typically, in a live environment, I'm I'm trying to get that off of my plate. I don't want to have anything to do with recording. Um, oh, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick that, that to another engineer. I'm going to kick that to, oh, like, okay, okay. like we'll have somebody else handle that entire right. thing. That's basically, they're treating that as their console and right, they're yeah. monitoring levels. They're making sure everything's recording and then they'll take that back and post. Right. Um, cool. Cool. So like the CMA event, we do, you know, we've done live stream past a uh, couple years. And uh, this year we're, we're also multi-tracking that. So we will do a live mix like on the fly, um, but we're also going to be recording all that stuff and multi-tracking it for post-production. So Hey, yeah. um, so here's what we're going to do, a quick schedule adjustment. We'll take a five-minute break instead of a 10-minute break. <laughs> um, and I think because um, the benefit to that is we're going to try to sneak in one more quick audio thing before we go into video. So uh, take five minutes now. Bathrooms downstairs, coffee, water, stretch, get the blood flowing. But five minutes, we'll be back here. stuff is here but just kind of going track by track and I'll bring things up take 
that in. Of course, the bass stops playing. Start back at the beginning here. So typically, I would march through kick, snare, toms, like I was talking about. But uh, these tracks are kind of just coming in a bunch of different spots. So I'm just trying to find stuff, and then I'll build it up. Then I've got this layer. These, I think, are all vocals. Get our vocals in a few minutes.
to the Glock and get that in. I 
and get saved now. After. Just kidding. That was awesome. Um, Steve, do you want to talk us through a couple things? Uh? Yeah, so um, I know I was flying through a lot of stuff there. I was, half the time I was just trying to find where my tracks were and kind of bring that um, up. But basically what I was looking to do was build um, the band together, try and create the, um, the kit and uh, the pad and keys, kind of locked those all in. I was sending some stuff to the subs for the bass and the kick drum, um, trying to keep everything else clean up top in the mains. Uh, and then uh, just looking to really create a nice, healthy um, mix there. And then working on the vocals and adding effects to the vocals. You heard that reverb pop in. I was playing around with a little delay on uh, Gabe's vocal there a little bit. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of fun stuff you can do with effects after you kind of have that mix built but uh yeah that's really what i was doing and then i was just kind of repeating that over and over and you know listening to it with fresh ears and being like hey how does this sound now and kind of stepping back so you kind of put on like your technical engineer brain for a minute and you're tweaking things and then you sit back and you go if i was a congregation member listening to this does it sound 
Mm. Cohesive, does it sound the way I would expect it to? So, you know, so my brain's constantly kind of be- bouncing back and forth between kind of, you know, listener and technical engineer. That's good. So. We, uh, one, one quick thing I wanted to point out, did everybody catch like you would find a problem area and spike it, mm-hmm. make it worse. Right. And then you knew that was what you needed to cut. Right, totally. Yeah, which is a huge step. Two, two comments or questions, Andrew in the back and then Holden. Andrew. Could you walk us through your thought process? Kind of like start to finish in terms of what are you starting with in terms of what you want to hear in the house? Like what are you building the mix around? And like what's the order you go through in terms of different instruments, different sections of that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, this wasn't a very good represent, representation of that because um, I was just kind of trying to find stuff all over the map. But t- typically, what I'll do is I'll start with the drum kit and basically get a nice, healthy level of the drum kit of where I want that um, volume to sit. And so I'll start with the kick drum, and then as I build the rest of the kit in, I'm like, all right, is this feel like where I want the, the kit to live in the mix. And then I usually use that as my baseline to kind of slide everything else around that. So, you know, I don't want my guitars way above that or buried below it so you can't hear it. And every instrument kind of has that same element of like, now we have some sort of anchor to work with. Um, and, you know, I kind of know because I, you know, I do it enough. I know sort of where 90, 95 dB lives just by hearing it, but you can use uh, like a, sound meter to kind of show you that. Um, that's usually kind of the, the number that I try and live around, you know, is 90 to 95. Rock shows are usually up towards 100, um, you know, and if you're under that, it's usually so quiet that people feel intimidated and don't want to sing out because they're like, we can't hear the band if we sing. So, you know, it's a nice um, kind of average number to use that way. But I, I use the, the drum kit to start, kind of start there. Yeah. Uh, so you use the drum kit, and it sounds like you go to like the guitars, bass, acoustic, like all that stuff next. Yeah. So I'll do the drums, and then I'll I'll usually try and lock the uh, the bass in with the kick, um, and try and create kind of a unit there. Um, and then. Um, Yeah, tonality, um, levels. Uh, does it sound like one instrument, or does it sound like? there's two competing things kind of going on. I'm, I'm always looking to kind of mesh and make like one unit out of, you know, all the pieces that are on stage, make it sound like one sound and one voice. Um, it's kind of the ultimate goal. Um, and I'm trying to look to do that step by step as I'm walking through that. So um, going, you know, drums and bass and usually bass and, and kick drum are the things that you're looking to kind of lock in there. Um, and that's also, as you're marching through that, that's a good way to tell how, you know, if there are issues with the actual player or issues with the actual instrument, you can solve those on the front end and be like, hey, your bass is buzzing or you're, you know, you need to stay on the click here or, you know, like that kind of stuff you obviously can't fix once it gets to you. So, um, you know, that allows you to kind of pinpoint some of those issues as well and have those conversations along the way. Um, but then, yeah, I kind of go to like the, the mid-range instruments, your guitars, your keys, um, kind of creating them. Usually they're also kind of acting as like your lead instruments or your solo instruments. So you want to make sure they're enough in the mix where, you know, your, your pad is probably just going to sit in there all the time. Um, but your key, uh, your keyboard may have, you know, a lick or something, or your guitar player is going to have a solo. So you want them to be kind of in the mix and then you'll be able to push them up enough to where it's not like, oh my gosh, where'd that guitar player come from? You know, so it was like, oh, the guitar was there, now he's just a little bit louder, you know? So some of those subtle kind of listening um, kind of tricks. And then your vocals are always sitting on top. So, awesome. yeah. La- last uh, quick question and then we'll, we'll wrap. Mute groups. Mute groups are great yeah. um, <laughs> because they allow you to get stuff on and off in like a second. Um, mute groups are over here on this console. Um, what I typically will do is I'll take uh, typical church service is probably going to have a band uh, minus the the keyboardist or whoever's going to come up and like underscore, you know, at the end of this <laughs> the uh, service. Excuse me. Um, and uh, so I will 
Um, usually leave the keys out of that. But what I'll do, the way you assign mute groups here is you hit the little mute group button, all these lights are gonna turn red. And then you hold down uh, the button that you wanna assign and you'll see all your select lights are the things that are, the ones that are lit are the ones that are in the mute group already. Um, and then you can add all of these. And so if I add those and I hit the mute group button again, then I should be able to. And then. And, and very uh, helpful. That's super handy for, yeah. you know, trying to, your band's coming back out for the last song or whatever. And then you just hit that and you're ready to go. Yeah. So. Hey, uh, one more time. Can we give it up for Steve and Jake? Yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, they work for Somerset Media. And um, like he said, they're integrators and they run sound for events. So um, any and all of your AV needs, you want to you check out their website, talk to them, email them. They're awesome.